it's an honor to serve him. It's an honor to have Jesus as my Lord, not the landlord. A lot of Christians treat Jesus as the landlord. See, landlord is about duty. Lord of lords is about devotion. Landlord is about, you know, just uh, have to rather than love to. One's about reason, the other's about revelation. One is about contract, the other one is about covenant. And I'm not contracted to do my gig, but I'm in covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you are in covenant with him, you learn to handle life's unexpected interruptions like a fire and like what's just happened this weekend in this part of New South Wales. And it was many, many years ago and it came to me in worship today when I went to the UK to preach in Liverpool and it just happened that a whole lot of stuff went wrong the day I was to speak in this particular church. The roads had all been blocked off because Prince Charles was coming through. And someone who had the exact same name same colored eyes, same colored hair as the pastor where I was going to preach, same name in the same city who was a cult leader was being exposed in the paper that day as a child molester. And the pastor of the church, people thought this was him. They even looked the same. And I had no idea this was all happening and I prepared a message on my way called Handling Life's Unexpected Interruptions. And you think, well, it was a very appropriate message. The message was the unexpected interruptions that come that are great and good. I've had many of those. And those that come that seem so unfair. You know, and I thought in that particular time as I was preparing, as I was going to this church, the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. A young teenage girl has an unexpected interruption. She'll wake up one morning and think, how can I give birth to the Savior of the world? I mean, it wasn't on the radar at all. And she has an unexpected interruption that causes a young teenage girl to say, let it be done unto me as God wants. What an incredible surrender of a young lady. And that same young lady had to stand the day that son was being crucified on a cross. Jesus looks down and she's not just part of the crowd. This was his mum. Jesus didn't die just for the whole world, but he also died for his mum. She was part of that. But can you imagine what an unexpected interruption that would have been? Why did he have to die? Why did I give birth to, to him? And now this is how he ends at 33 years of age. Pretty scary. Jesus looks down from the cross and says to John, there's your mum, look after my mum. That's a pretty heavy, unexpected interruption. I look at the life of Joseph, not her husband, but the other Joseph that we preach a lot about who has a dream from God. And he ends up being thrown into a pit, but doesn't throw a pity party. Life's unexpected interruptions that come that seem so unfair at times gets thrown into Potiphar's house of misquotation and misunderstanding, keeps his heart right and ends up in a prison. You think after doing the right thing and running from temptation that things would break open for you. But you end up in a prison. You think, thanks a lot, God. I've given you my whole life. I felt like that when my son died. God, you know why? And I felt how self-righteous I'd become and you end up in this prison that you feel that you can't break out of. And then you start interpreting other people's dreams in your prison when you can't interpret your own. Welcome to leadership. Welcome to pastors who counsel people's marriages and help people on their journeys and sometimes haven't got a clue what's going on in their own life. But out of a heart of obedience, still keep doing what's right. Oh, that's handling life's unexpected interruptions. He's interpreting someone else's dream. And then the people that he interpreted the dreams for forgot him. And then there comes a one day. I thank God for that one day where he had to go and get shaved and get cleaned and put on the right clothes and because he's about to stand in front of a king that's going to make him the prime minister of a nation. 
How do you start in a pit of unfairness and end up in the palace of prime ministership? Every one of us in this room is called to be a prime minister. We're all called to be at the forefront of what God wants to do on the planet. When Chris passed away two years ago, and many of you know the story, if you're new to the church, our son was killed in January 2016. I've shared the story here and and killed by a lightning strike. I thought to myself, I'll never be able to preach on miracles. I'll never be able to preach on God is faithful and good and comes through for you. Because of my story, that didn't seem to make sense. But you know, it was 27 years ago that God put a promise in my heart that one day, like Daniel in the Bible, went into Babylon and impacted the community, that I would have an anointing with our church to go into our community and to have an impact on outside the four walls of the church. I thought that came to an end when my story seemed to be so sad. Wind the clock forward over the last two years. Over the last two years, it's been harder watching my grandkids grow up and look different now than when their dad passed away. Sitting with my 16-year-old grandson every Wednesday night and I'm discipling him. I'm doing discipleship with him. And last Wednesday, I said, Ezekiel, how do you feel? What are you getting from this? And he goes, you know, no, no. I'm learning how to hear the voice of God. This is the boy that lost his dad. But he looked at me, and like an Italian, you can imagine I fell apart. I am Italian. He looked at me and goes, Nono, the most important thing is I'm getting to know you better as my Nono. I walked out the room and bawled my eyes out. I thought, I've got to learn how to stop this, because otherwise you'll never tell me anything. His other brother, Ezekiel, which, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Elijah, which I showed you his revelation last time I was here, of his, at the age of 11, having a revelation from God. I'm babysitting them, and next to the bed is the prayer that my son used to pray over his kids before they went to bed. My other grandson says, No, no, will you pray daddy's prayer over me? I start praying the prayer, and I'm halfway through the prayer, and I lose it. And he starts to rub my back. Sits up in bed, he goes, don't be upset, no, no. Heaven is our home. You know, we're going we're gonna to be okay. We've got to keep preaching the gospel. It's my 11-year-old grandson counseling his pastor, grandfather. And you go from that and thinking, you walk with so much pain and you walk with a limp and you think, how is another day going to happen? And then the promises of God come flooding back, living with life's unexpected interruptions and God says to me you're going to influence Babylon Thursday the day before Easter Friday I get a phone call from the premier of South Australia he's just been elected as premier his name is Stephen Marshall I know this is recorded I'm telling you the truth I'm not preaching now I'm telling you the truth (laughs) I'm not evangelistically stretching it okay so He says, Danny, can you pick me up for church tomorrow morning? I said, you've just been elected as premier. You have cars with bodyguards that take you to places. And he goes, no, I want you and Sharon to pick me up. And over the last 12 months or so, in the midst of my pain, he sat on the front row at my son's funeral, prophesied over him and said, you are going to be our next premier. And I had a meeting with him and some of my non-Christian friends and and also my Christian friends about what difference are you going to make in our community if you become the leader. It was an amazing time as he shared, I can't do this without the church. I can't do this without people like you that love our community. So on Thursday he rings, can you pick me up for church? We picked him up from his home and drove him to church and in the car, He's quoting what he's going to do, and I won't repeat it, what he's going to do with his team and staff to get them on the same page and starts quoting the stuff that I'd been putting into him and our church had been quoting and he'd been to enough events to hear stuff like humility and servanthood. And he's quoting back, he goes, what do you think? And my mind goes back to the promise, you'll be in Babylon one day. 
influencing Babylon. It seemed like the enemy had a plan that was going to bring this all unstuck. But ladies and gentlemen, we're not called just to go to church. We're called to be the church. And in being the church, we've got to handle unexpected interruptions. And I certainly am so proud of your pastors this morning in what happened yesterday and how, uh, how challenging that would have been, but a great attitude even talking about what's happening in Syria. That's handling life's unexpected interruptions, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. We're married to Jesus and the promises he's put in our hearts will come to pass no matter what life throws up at us because we are different to the world. And the message I want to bring this morning is called Citizens of Heaven. We are, as Christians, a group of people on the planet that need to do things very different than the world out there because we live by the culture of our country. We live by the culture of where we come from. We don't live for eternity. We live from eternity. And this morning, I'm going to share a little bit about that. But just as I've been traveling, you know, last time I was with you, It was my very first week living by faith. I left here on Sunday. I went to Hillsong on Monday. And in a 15-minute period, in the entrance hall of the conference, three different people came up to me, said, we didn't know we were going to bump into you. Can we talk to you? God has told us to sponsor your ministry. Within 10 minutes, $30,000 was given to me. Now, it doesn't go to Sharon and I. It goes to our ministry that's going to make the foundation for all that we do and who we raise up. But God had told me to step out in faith. And I'm thinking, isn't it enough to lose a son, to go through shakings of every kind? And then God says, give up your salary, give up everything and live by faith. I thought that was the devil. I told Satan to get behind me. He goes, it looks the same from back here. So, you know, I had to make some calls about stepping out in faith since I was with you last. God has opened up every door that he promised, including going to overseas and speaking to evangelicals that want to know about Pentecost. I've just been invited to speak at a conference of 10,000 pastors with the only other speaker, a guy called Ravi Zachariah, And I'm thinking, why did you pick me? I just tell jokes and have one-liners. And they said God challenged them to have someone that would touch their minds, but they needed someone to massage their hearts. And they said, we need both of you. And I think, I love that guy. I listen to his stuff and I'm going, now I'm going to preach to 10,000 evangel, It was a promise God gave me, but I didn't have the ministry of hints trying to open doors for myself. I'm going, God, well, if that's you, you're going to have to open the door. And so you live with these contrasts of pain and purpose. All at the same time, I spoke here last year about living with contrasts. Still living with those contrasts. I miss my son more than ever. Watching my 16-year-old grandson look just like his dad. But his dad's not here to see how proud he would be of him serving Jesus in the midst of his pain. So it's been an incredible journey as I've traveled around the body of Christ. I've been in every kind of abomination, I mean denomination, and uh, working with all kinds of churches and some pretty weird stuff. I'm just going to read to you what I wrote when I woke up this morning so that I don't get it wrong, but... As I look around, there's a godly dissatisfaction right now. There's a godly dissatisfaction around the body of Christ because there's more for the church than what we're experiencing. We're called to transform communities and we're called to release people in church world to fruitfulness, dominion, and multiplication. That is God's promise at the beginning of every new generation. Genesis. Right with Adam and Eve, I've called you to be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. After Noah builds the ark and they come out of the ark, 
He tells them to be fruitful, have dominion, and multiply. He tells Joshua, everywhere you put your foot, the same thing is going to happen, a new generation. He tells Abraham the same thing, every new generation. We are on the verge of a complete new reformation of Christianity right across the planet. And people are sick of stuff that's not authentic. Before I finish today, I'm going to prophesy what I see over your house. What I feel every time I walk in here, I'll get you to judge it. But what I've discovered in my travel is that some people have parked at the ark. I'm going to read something to you out of Genesis chapter 6. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth and he saw that everything they thought or imagined. Can you believe that? We think God only sees what we proclaim. Now, he sees what we think. He sees what we imagine. And was con- uh, con- constantly and tot- it was constantly and total evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. And then I read this. It broke his heart. Do you know I live every day with a broken heart? I do. And people that don't have that experience can't fully understand what it's like to have a broken heart. But that's nothing compared to the God who created us. Looking down on this planet, what's happening in Syria right now and everywhere around the world, don't tell me it doesn't break his heart. And God knows what it is to have a broken heart. But then it says, but, in verse 8, but Noah found favor with the Lord. I believe God has found, and I'm not patronizing you, God has found favor with this house I believe you're about to move into more and and, and you're not to be restricted for what God wants to do because God's looking for people that have an authentic posture that go, we're not trying to be churchians. We're not trying to have the biggest church in town. We want to raise up disciples because there's a world out there on the other side of our obedience that is broken and hurt. But Hope Point Church, but Hope Point Church, God raises up. You see, as I travel around Australia, most churches that I've gone to in the last six months are parking at the issues of the ark. Did you know the ark wasn't meant to be the final destination? The ark was meant to take people to a destination. It was a place of protection. It was a place of incredible, uh, you know, uh, protection from the storms of life. It was a place of deliverance. But they needed to get to purpose. And the purpose wasn't we're going to stay in the ark forever. I'm dealing with boards that are splitting churches over the color of a building. Or whether we should do an extension. Whether we should spend money on that. And they are parking at issues of the ark. If you park at the ark, you'll lose your spark. You won't make a mark and you'll lose your heart. I can turn that into a rap song. Too many Christians parking at issues of the ark. Why isn't my ministry recognized? How come I didn't get that role? So many dysfunctional Christians as I travel this nation, not at Hope Point Church, but as I travel this nation. And let me tell you, I did some really deep research. And I found that one elephant in the ark would do 36 kilos of poo a day. That's a lot of poo. 36 kilos. And I want to tell you, when we park inside the ark and never go to a higher place of destiny where the doors of the ark are opened up and we get out in partnership and we multiply and we're fruitful and we have dominion, we will end up with the stink called churchianity and church politics that is never going to affect the world out there. I'm grateful that you have senior leaders that hate religion. I'm I'm grateful that you have senior leaders that don't want to park at the ark. They want to build the ark. You see, we're not meant to bash the ark. We're meant to build the ark. We're meant to be blessed by the ark. Thank God that this church called the ark or, or the ark that's called the church, it's a picture of the church in some ways, we realize that it is a place of deliverance for the Christian and the non-Christian. It is a place of safety. It's a place of partnership. They had to go in there two by two, and they needed to be in partnership. 
But there's also a purpose when the doors of the ark are opened and we have impact on a community and we have dominion and we're fruitful and we multiply. But to do that, my friends, we need to get back to being identified as citizens of heaven where we carry the accent of what the church is all about. I believe God is beautifying the church. I believe the church is going to be, it is going to be a major turnaround and people are going to run to the church like the, like the uh, Premier of South Australia. When I took him home, I began to ask him if I could help in government, in areas of counselling, families in his political party that are leaders, but they might have a son on ice. They might have issues with drug situation. And I said, this is what I've done, Premier. I fly home every Monday And from Tuesday to Thursday, before I fly out again, I serve as a volunteer in my community. So on the weekends, I get my income from ministering. But during the week, I do everything I do for free. I'm now getting, I've got seven unchurched people groups that I'm meeting with to do mediation with right now, simply because I believe we're going to get out of the ark. I believe we can't park at the ark. It can't be about me being a, a guest speaker. It's about being equipped so we can go out there and change our communities. We need bivocational ministers. I'm prophesying right now. People that have businesses that help build the purposes of God. And it's not a distinction. They are ministers in the marketplace, helping to build the house of God as well. And there's no division between them because Jesus said my church I will build and it will be a church that the gates of hell will not be able to stop and our greatest days are going to come as the church becomes the church can you say amen I'm getting passionate my microphone hasn't cut out Father Richard Raw, a Catholic priest who is born again and knows God very very powerfully he's one of the greatest foremost Catholic leaders in the world who is very different to what you would expect. A couple of weeks ago, he said this, Christianity is a lifestyle, a way of being in the world that is simple, nonviolent, shared and loving. However, we made it into an established religion and all that goes with that and avoided the lifestyle change itself. One could be warlike, greedy, racist, selfish and vain in most of Christian history, and still believe that Jesus is one's personal Lord and Savior. The world has no time for such silliness anymore. The suffering on earth is too great. And in the context of that this morning, not because my son passed away, but just for a couple of minutes, I want to talk about having the accent of heaven. We should be recognized by our accents. If I talk to a South African here this morning, a South African, I will pick up the accent. I'm the son of a migrant, and I was raised here in Australia, so I don't have the Italian accent. But if you go and visit my dad, who's been here as long as I have, since 1960, he still talk a like of that, you know? So when you visit my dad, who's looking after my mum in a nursing home while he lives at home, but is with her every day, she doesn't recognize him, she doesn't know who he is. But if you ask him, hey, Brother Guglielmucci, how are you today? You know, thanks to God. That's a life, you know. You know, one a day, 50-50, you know. One a day, I'm a like of this. Another day, I'm a like of that. You know, when my father talks like that, you're not going to think he comes from China. You're not going to think he's Chinese. You're not going to say, oh, he comes from Hong Kong. When you go to my dad's place, you're never going to smell dim sims cooking in the kitchen. I love dim sims. But my dad doesn't know how to cook them because he's not Chinese or Asian. He's Italian. You smell meatballs cooking and the red Italian sauce. So his accent is connected to his culture. When we came to Australia, we all bought valiants. (laughs) Through our God, we shall drive valiants. My dad never bought a Camry. They drove valiants. With the dice around the... You never have beautiful rocks in the front garden. You've got fruit trees. You drive my dad's front yard. is full of fruit trees and lettuce. He's got not enough room. And then anything there's nothing growing is cement. The Italians came. They saw they concreted. That's what happened. 
So when you go to my dad's place, you, you're not going to think a South African lives here or a, a, someone from Hong Kong lives here or China. You can just tell by the cream brick house, solid brick. You don't, you're not buy this a brick of it here. You've got to have a solid brick. That was my dad. So my dad's known by his culture, but he's known by his accent. Our clothes, the way we used to dress when we came to Australia. Everybody tried to look like Elvis when I came to Australia. I remember the first time I led worship, I had long hair. I just wish I had hair now. Sideburns and flares. And I'm playing the guitar. My beloved is mine and I am his and his banner over me is love. And I'm moving around and one of the board members, the first time I led worship, went up to Pastor Andrew Evans. He goes, who's that guy up there wiggling his hips like Elvis? And sweating like a pig. Why do we have him leading worship? I'm glad someone b believed in me and saw another accent than just the outward. And today I'm standing here because of his belief in me. But accents give us away. That's why it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. So here's what I want you to do in the Message Bible. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you if we embrace the culture and accent of where we come from, from home. Philippians chapter 4, I'm going to give you five things you can write down. As one of the many pictures in the Bible of what it means to have an accent of heaven. Now, my son Chris, before he passed, always talked about heaven. He preached lots of messages on heaven. But I've got to be honest, I didn't come to Jesus because of what he would do for me. I came to Jesus because I didn't want to go to hell. And I saw A Thief in the Night. Now, if you saw the movie, A Thief in the Night, where, you know, a guy called Barry Smith was going around Australia with 666, the mark of the beast. We got married at 19 because we thought Jesus was coming back any day. We wanted to try marriage before it was too late. It's like, it was all about heaven. But we've swung so far the other way that today everything that's preached is about what happens down here. And I'm glad that my son had a revelation of heaven because he's there now. But I'm glad I didn't come to Jesus because of what happens down here. I came to Jesus because he's the truth. And I came to Jesus because I live from eternity, not for eternity. I wouldn't be able to cope today if that wasn't my philosophy. And as Christians, we've got to see things from our home country. In Philippians chapter 4, and we'll read it in a moment, Philippi was a colony of Rome. So the Philippians lived in Philippi, but they lived by the rules of Rome. Paul writes to the Philippian believers and says, just like you live in Philippi, you live by the culture of Rome. You are also citizens of heaven. While you're living on colony earth, you must live by the culture of heaven. And I want to tell you, if we get hold of this, it's interesting that as I travel, Pastors all over the world are starting to preach about eternity again because they're realizing if we only prepare people for down here, then any unexpected interruption that comes our way, we're not going to cope. But we're all dying and we're all leaving because the planet is cursed and we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. This is not the end. Sickness will be no more. My, my son won't die again. He lives now forever. And I want to tell you, we need to come back to the accent of where we come from because when we have the accent of heaven it changes everything we do and so here we have five postures I'm going to read to you Philippians chapter 4 and in fact my friends if you read most of Paul's writing he starts with eternity he goes because of heaven sort that out because eternal life is at stake sort that out we don't do that anymore and so let me read to you therefore Chapter 4, verse 1. My dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. Now I appeal to 
Iodia and Sintichi. I think she was in Star Wars. Yoda and Sintichi, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. You see, we can work hard and tell others the good news and still become, behave stupidly. These two women were great, but they were doing something really stupid. They wouldn't sort out their differences. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my work co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Always be full of joy in the Lord. You know, rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. And I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. So why are we considerate? Because we have a different accent. We are citizens of heaven. The Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about those things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Write these words down. I'll give them to you quite quickly, but I hope they'll be meaningful. The first posture or accent of heaven is partnership. Hey, women, sort out your issue. The devil hates the church being united. I'm thankful that I'm in a united church this morning, not a uniting church, a united church. But I want to tell you, never never get tired of fighting for partnership because that's discipleship. That's what discipleship's all about. I use the word DNA. The word DNA means a divine natural alignment. A divine natural alignment. It's natural, but it's divine and it's alignment. 2 Corinthians 12, 18, Paul sends Titus and one of his mates to minister to the Corinthians. And he goes, these guys do things the same way, walk in each other's steps and have the same spirit. Can you imagine what could happen at Hope Point Church if everyone that joins this house go, I am going to be in partnership with what God's called this church to be, what God's called this house to be, a spirit of not just showing up, not just enjoying the fellowship, but being in partnership and he's saying here listen if you're citizens of heaven you live in philippi but you live by the rules of rome just like you live on earth and live by heaven's rules stay in partnership and i want to say this today it says in proverbs 27 verse 6 faithful are the wounds of a friend wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy good partnership in a church means we connect with each other it means we comfort each other but also confront each other without getting upset. Can you imagine if we had that kind of maturity in the church? One of the things I love about Pastor Warren is he asks me, what do you see in me? What do I need to change? There's a teachability. There's a reachability. God can do something. People are looking for authentic church. They're not looking for the show. They're looking for the glow. And I want to tell you, my friends, today, we've got to understand that if we're going to carry the accent so people look at us and go, there's Christian." Because they know how to do conflict resolution. We should be the best on the planet in conflict resolution. That's why I'm doing mediation in my community right now. I've got an Italian family in Adelaide that have hit the wall. I've never heard the F word more than last week in my house. Every couple of seconds, F and this and F and that, while my wife is cooking ravioli trying to calm them down so we can feed them. They're not Christians. And they're just about killing each other. And I say, stop, stop, stop. You've got to understand, you don't want me to preach at you, but I have a worldview. I have an accent. I didn't use those words, but I, for your sake this morning, I have an accent. My accent is forgiveness is where everything starts. But you're not willing to forgive each other. It's all about inheritance. It's about money. And so they left my house after three and a half, four hours. My wife is stunned. And a few minutes later, the phone rings. We're sorry. We're sorry. We shouldn't have done that. We need to listen more to what you've got to say. They're coming back this week. And I'm going to share the gospel and say the reason you can't fix this is because you don't know the God who can fix this. And so I want to tell you, we've got to have that accent. We should be the best at conflict resolution. Yeah, not all for Jesus I'm offended. 
So number one, the accent of partnership. Number two, the accent of a positive faith posture. Rejoice in the Lord always doesn't mean running around car parks with your hands raised, speaking in tongues. Rejoice in the Lord again always. I'm not very happy right now. I lost a son. I don't feel like laughing a lot, although I do. But I'm not rejoiced by rejoicing. Ha, 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 ha. Rejoice in the Lord always to me means this. Listen carefully. Rejoice in the Lord always. I have to rejoice every day to have a positive faith future. Because everything inside of me wants to give up. And so every day I get out of bed and I rejoice to have a positive faith future. And say, God, you're in control. And I love you, Jesus. And I am going to hug people that are broken. And every church I've preached in since I've seen you last, I have the altar call after the meeting's finished. I send people home. And I said, if you're broken, I'll stay down here and speak to you as long as I need to. Some churches, two hours. One of my jackets, I can't get the mascara out of the shoulder pads because of the tears. But I help them rechoice. Pastor Danny, if you can stand, can I stand? Yes, I rechoice. Every day I rechoice. Because when I rechoice, you see, number one is that you stay in partnership, a spirit of unity and partnership. That's the accent of heaven. Number two, positive faith future or posture, a positive faith posture of rechoicing every day. Number three is prayer. It says pray without ceasing. How do you pray without ceasing? I don't pray without ceasing the way we think that means. What that means to me, ladies and gentlemen, and I think it makes sense when I share it to you, is a constant posture of humility and a constant posture of dependency. The minute I get out of bed, I depend on you today, God. God, I humble myself before you, and as I'm driving in my car, you can speak any time. As I'm having lunch with someone, you can drop something in my heart. As a name comes on my mind, I'll ring them up and see how they're going. It's praying without ceasing. It's dependency and humility that I'm only one decision away from becoming a total idiot on my own. But I can daily depend on him. I can, you know, every church I go to, I stress out. Because do I have the right word? Don't I have the right word? Am I supposed to say that? I, because I don't want to be a gig speaker because you see, I want you to have a positive faith posture. I want you to be in partnership because I believe that with all my heart. But I want you to be dependent and humble before the Lord and go, I can't do my business without revelation. I can't do church without revelation. I can't do marriage without revelation. But God, I pray without ceasing. I'm constantly dependent. I'm cost- constantly, and sure you have your prayer time, but praying without ceasing is more than going into a room and shutting the door. It's that constant consciousness that I need God. What a beautiful posture that is. The next one is the peace that comes when we trust sovereignty, when we don't have clarity. I want the musicians to come. That'll just make everybody think I'm going to finish. I will, I, will, I promise. The micro, you could actually cut this microphone when you want me to finish and I'll just think it's electricity. They won't know that you cut me off. (laughs) So the peace. Let me say this. If we are not in partnership, if we don't have a positive faith posture, and we're not prayerfully depending on God, we'll never get peace. But if we get those three things right, the peace that passes all understanding, my whole family has peace. My little granddaughter who's seven at the graveside of my son holding onto my jeans and going, no, no, why isn't daddy coming home? And I'm standing there going, oh my God, this hurts. And then we all get in the car, we go home for dinner and we start talking about one day we're going to see daddy again. Jesus is with us. And she comes and sits on my knee last Saturday night. I was in Sydney last Saturday, somewhere around here. And I got home Saturday night and she's at the door. Every car that went past, she thought it was me coming home. And my wife said to me, she just kept jumping out of bed every time she heard a car. Then when I op- she opened the door for the final time and I walked in the door, she jumped up into my lap. She's seven. She's hanging on to me. And in my head, I know these are the hugs that she used to get from her dad that she can't get from him anymore. And you know, for 15 minutes, I just held her and 
gave her lollies and then said, you know, you need to go to bed now. You know, you need to get up early in the morning. She goes, okay, no, no. Jumps into bed and fell asleep. There was a peace beyond the pain that even in that little girl, I could see the grace of God. I walked out, fell apart, but underlying it all, peace that passes all understanding which takes me to the last one which is the practice of our faith where it goes on and says whatever things are good practice those things daily I reckon if we did those things non-Christians would look at us and go I know your accent I know where you're from I know where you belong because the early Christians in the book of Acts were called Christians by non-Christians They were the Christ ones, recognized by those outside of the family of faith. That's all coming back, friends. Tonight I'm going to speak on God's having a party. Are you coming? I'm going to talk about discipleship, which is being spoken about all over the world. And your church has embraced the dust. I know that story. It's being preached all over the world, not because people are listening to podcasts, because something's rising up about discipleship let me close with this three evidences of being a disciple if you're a disciple see we, we think you can be a christian and then be a disciple that is utter garbage where did we get that from either jesus is lord or he's not and if he's lord we're all disciples following him and there are three evidences of being a disciple number one love by this shall all men know you what churchians No, by this shall all men know you're my disciples. That's the accent of heaven. By the love you have one for another. Not when everything's going good, but in all seasons. Number two, fruit. Let me read John 15. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything and it will be granted to you because you produce much fruit and you are my true disciples. So the three things are love, fruit, and continuance. Finishing our race. I'm going to finish my race. What happens if another member of my family dies? What happens if my house gets burned down? What happens if I do get a diagnosis of cancer? When does Jesus stop being Lord? I don't want those things. I pray they don't happen and I'll believe for them not to happen. But we've been through some stuff. Love, fruit, and continuance. If you remain in me, you are my disciples. I'm going to finish my race. Not well done, good and famous servant. But well done, good and faithful. Because I carry the accent of home. Oh, I want to go home where the language there won't sound strange. You can talk like this over there. And you can talk in Egyptian. And you can talk in Russian. You can talk in any language, but somehow in heaven, it all filters into one one accent. 